ricerca di interessi e io mi astengo un momento da qualsiasi commento perché i commenti li faranno tutti i curatori, diciamo gli interlocutori di Johan Selsing. Ho solo due cose da dire. Noi siamo molto grati di avere un architetto di grande qualità che rappresenta anche come tradizione familiare, perché è figlio di un altro architetto, sempre un Selsing Peter questa volta, anche lui bravissimo, rappresenta però una cultura che è quella scandinava, che è ra radicalmente diversa dal nostro modo di vedere l'architettura, però ha delle affinità profonde, dei grandi fascini. Tutti i romani in particolare hanno sempre in qualche modo guardato l'architettura scandinava con un'attenzione totale. Penso che ne so, Quaroni, giovane, stava con le fotografie delle, degli edifici di Asplund a cercare di interpretare, per cui c'è questa strana... Perché l'architettura scandinava in generale è complicata nella sua infinita apparente semplicità. La vedi? Vedi queste cose? Vedi il cimitero di Asplund, la, il crematorio, la, la. due muri, due cose. Io sono andato a visitare anche le cose di Leverets, semplici apparentemente, non appena eh, c'entri un po' dentro ti accorgi che sono complicate, oscure, piene di significati, cariche, anche inquietanti delle volte, pur essendo come dire, il contrario esatto di tante cose che vanno per la maggiore, clamorose, sfarzose, eccetera, e poi quando vai a guardarle meglio c'è niente dentro, non so come dire, esattamente il rovescio. E questo secondo me è la cosa che mi sento di dire, poi magari intervengo dopo perché non è che non ne sappia nulla, un, però non sono un conoscitore, per cui noi abbiamo, la proposta di questa cosa viene da Gui e Baratelli, che è qui accanto a me, a cui si prenderà l'incarico di fare una breve presentazione, un po' più chiara della mia, perché la mia non è una presentazione, è solo una espressione di contentezza in quanto rappresentante dell'Accademia di fare una cosa così interessante. Poi abbiamo Peter Selsing che farà una lezione da solo, la vuole gestire in modo suo, quindi c'è tutta una sua strategia. E poi in conclusione altri due invitati che hanno un ruolo, come si può dire, di commentatori, domande, e sono altre due persone molto amate da me, che sono una giovanissima docente di Roma 3 che si chiama Carlotta Torricelli, appena, appena nominata, in qualche, o forse neanche ancora nominata, non so esattamente quale sia la situazione, comunque diciamo è una, una docente di Roma 3 a tutti gli effetti, anche gli studenti, quindi qualcosa di, di concreto c'è. E eh, Antonello Alici, che invece è, un, è uno storico dell'architettura, è un docente di Ancona, credo, dell'ingegneria dell Ancona, che è anche un... tutti e due sono esperti... Eh, lei più giovane, l'altro non, non vecchissimo, comunque un po' più scafato, di, di architettura appunto scandinava. Eh, lei dalla, dalla, dalla tesi di dottorato per l'appunto su Leverens e lui per tantissimi altri studi ripetutamente fatti e pubblicazioni sul tema. Quindi sono due persone a cui affidiamo il ruolo, come si può dire, di interpreti e critici fin in fondo di, questa, di questo contributo. Con, i miei, con le mie felicitazioni e ringraziamenti e dell'Accademia mi, mi metto seduto e mi metto a sentire. Guia, tocca a te, devi premere questo cosetto. Sì, sì. Buonasera, io vorrei innanzitutto ringraziare l'Accademia Nazionale di San Luca che ha dato questa opportunità e ha accolto diciamo, la richiesta eh, di invitare qua Johan Celsing, quindi chiaramente Francesco Cellini come vicepresidente, lo staff per intero, molto professionale e ringrazio chiaramente Celsing che ha accolto con molto entusiasmo eh, l'invito e chiaramente i nostri discussants e eh, il pubblico anche qui in sala. Quindi eh, io partirei con una domanda, cioè perché, in parte riallacciandomi a quanto già ha detto Cellini, perché abbiamo invitato Johan Celsing, un architetto svedese, qui all'Accademia. E eh, appunto si potrebbe dire, guardando i suoi interessi, 
perché è un architetto che eh, conosce il greco, per esempio, oppure perché eh, declama Dante, eh, essendo in un'accademia, ma questo non ci sembra, diciamo, il punto, il solo punto di interesse, di curiosità, che, eh, di domande che ci possono suscitare eh, Johann Scherzing, in particolare, secondo me, è un più un'esigenza di chiedersi cosa significa oggi, in un'epoca contemporanea, eh, diciamo, avere una visione umanistica in architettura. Quindi eh, io dirò alcune note introduttive brevissimamente, eh, alcune le avete già lette, cioè un architetto tra i più importanti nello scenario nordico che si è dedicato a molti temi, la casa, la residenza collettiva, le gallerie espositive, ma anche edifici per la cultura, chiese, eh, ha, eh, diciamo, all'attivo uno studio da almeno tre decenni è stato docente presso Royal Institute of Technology eh, di Stoccolma e eh, è stato lecturer visiting presso diverse università estere, oltre a essergli stato conferito recentemente il premio RIBA. Eh, vorrei aggiungere forse pochissime note biografiche, io mi riallaccio anche qui a Cellini che ha sottolineato un rapporto anche con il, il padre, ma eh, in realtà è diciamo un primo stadio, eh, cioè Chelsing come architetto eh, ha avuto una formazione giovanile sicuramente al di fuori rispetto alle esperienze comuni di un architetto, il padre era un, una figura molto importante ma sicuramente lo ha iniziato ad alcune eh, attività anche ludiche che hanno lasciato il segno, la, la piccola casa in mattoni a Sigtuna nell'estate del 62 è un esempio. E, mh, al di là di questo eh, sicuramente eh, lui ha avuto la spinta a scegliere questo tipo di carriera quando il padre eh, diciamo, è venuto a mancare in età molto giovane quindi eh, si è formato diciamo, autonomamente e mescolando anche esperienze diverse come quella delle arti perché per un anno ha studiato all'Académie de la Grande Chaumière di Parigi quindi questi dati biografici hanno un'importanza secondo me. Poi toccherò brevissimamente alcuni temi suoi, eh, uno di questi è quello dell'appropriatezza, i latini direbbero il decorum eh, o eh, i francesi la convenance forse, per dire che è un tema diciamo, in realtà molto praticato dagli architetti della storia, ricercare l'appropriatezza di un edificio rispetto a una condizione. Se si guardano, se si osservano le opere di Chelsing a una prima scorsa, sono tutte diverse. L'impostazione, diciamo, di base, eh, un'omogeneità di fondo rimane, ma eh, la chiesa o l'edificio specialistico, eh, il municipio che non c'è, ma diciamo <ride> per fare un esempio, eh, hanno tutti un carattere diverso. Quindi questa differenza, diciamo, caratteriale, evidentemente rivela una, una grande attenzione per quello che è eh, la condizione peculiare in cui un'architettura deve poi manifestarsi. Ma eh, appunto, eh, quindi, eh, Cialzini rifiuta un'immagine unica, livellante de, de, dell'architettura, ogni progetto ha un suo tono, se brevemente dico anche qui, se si osserva il crematorio di Stoccolma, allora abbiamo un un masso nel bosco, lui dice una stone in the forest, che è un, un edificio molto chiuso, molto ermetico rispetto per esempio alla eh, Boniard Gallery che si trova nella stessa capitale ma che è un edificio trasparente che interagisce diciamo, con la città e quindi che ha un apporto diverso. Herman Cech, uno dei suoi architetti di riferimento, direbbe un teatro non deve assomigliare a una fabbrica né la banca ad un caffè, questo eh, evidente. Quindi un'architettura un attenta anche chiaramente alle esigenze dei fruttori, degli abitanti e, e, di, e dei destinatari ultimi dell'opera. Una seconda brevissimamente considerazione è, eh, e questo probabilmente i nostri discussant potranno eh, cogliere meglio questo punto, la relazione con le regole eh, dell'architettura o con l'architettura in senso più lato. Eh, Parlerà Celsing molto di ritmo, di proporzioni, di riferimenti ai testi letterari, in particolare con la poesia, dove diciamo che la precisione della struttura metrica trova anche rispondenze nell'organizzazione della pianta. 
e a uno sguardo più ampio viene da chiedersi ma quanti sono gli architetti che nel corso del Novecento si sono occupati diciamo, di, di, di temi analoghi? Beh, se, se noi escludiamo figure di, di grande rilievo ne, ne conosciamo pochi, potremmo citare il danese sempre in terra scandinava Stenel Rasmussen che parlava di ritmo, di proporzione, o ancora eh, l'olandese Hans van der Laan, che aveva scritto Architettoni Space ancora nel 77, o sulla scia della tendenza i disegni, gli studi e le opere dello svizzero Peter Mercury, ma sono veramente pochi. E Chelsea comunque non va letto attraverso gli occhi del dogmatismo, eh, neanche quello della corrente architettonica, eh, il suo interesse è piuttosto quello di instaurare sempre una, una sinestesia all'interno delle sue opere, viene da usare questo termine, e cioè di superare diciamo, la priorità dell'elemento visuale eh, anche con componenti che sono presenti nell'architettura ma che non sono appunto visibili. E la dimensione materica appunto è una di queste, quindi anche qui ci si riaggancia a una tradizione di grandi maestri, da Leverence ad Aspun, ma anche eh, Tessenov o gli austriaci Loss, la scuola viennese. Un bagaglio culturale che fa parte della sua eh, formazione, che lui diciamo, anche reinterpreta. E, dirò poi, quasi per chiudere brevemente, che eh, Chelsea manipola spesso, reinventa delle soluzioni che a noi appaiono nuove a prima vista. E, e questo lo fa anche con molta dedizione, per esempio con grandi modelli dimostrativi a scala 1 a 1, i mock-ups. Eh, in altri casi, eh, diciamo che l'elaborazione iniziale, se si osserva il suo processo creativo, è sempre molto eh, tormentata, ma in senso buono, nel senso che si colgono i diversi schizzi, e, mh, nel suo studio eh, abbondano diciamo, le maquette di ogni tipo, eh, dalla creta al cartoncino e, e questo ci fa capire che l'architettura è un processo che si mette sempre in discussione, cioè che non eh, trova eh, diciamo, la sua conclusione finché non trova il giusto ordine e quindi finché la costruzione non si fa poesia. E, in tutto ciò, pur nell'esattezza diciamo, di, di questo processo, proprio dentro l'esatta costruzione trova luogo anche la variazione e il felice accidentismo, se vogliamo usare un termine a lui caro che proviene da Josef Frank, il celebre architetto austriaco emigrato in Svezia, e quindi diciamo che l'irregolarità e eh, ciò che è inatteso deve essere riassorbito entro un processo come parte significativa di esso e che quindi anche l'architettura deve essere arricchita da questa eh, accidente. Ecco, io quindi, dette queste poche note introduttive e sicuramente insufficienti, lascio la parola al, al nostro conferenziere. So, uh, I'd like to hand over the letter to you, Johan. So, welcome to San Luca. <laughs> Yes, so thank you, Goya, very much for your introduction. Um, ma uh, non parlo italiano, uh, uh, but uh, I uh, can understand uh, certain things quite well. But I'm truly, and so I'm truly honored to be invited to this institution. So thank you, Architetti Cellini and uh, Baratelli, and for this invitation. It's, a, it's fantastic of course, and this distinguished institution and this remarkable house. And as well, you have coming from the, you know, the, the barbarian northern fringes of Europe, coming back to summer, it's just amazing. So there are so many reasons to cherish these kind of occasions. I'm really grateful for your invitation. I'm very happy to see uh, other friends that I know from Sweden, Antonello, Alici, and uh, um, uh, Carlotta, and also colleagues from uh, uh, whom I met with um, was it uh, Porto Academy recently, and so there are people from here and there that I, I've met. And I will present my work, uh, evidently, and uh, you saw a title, or there is, I don't know if 
Yes, now it's gone. Uh, so the title is Plans, Meters, Paradoxes. And I must say the title could have had many other wordings. It could have been, could have dealt with patents. It could have dealt with precedents. I will return to several previous architects, uh, ancient ones and recent ones as well. So precedents could be another one. Reason and rhyme could be another title that I could easily have chosen. Constraints, or should we say the liberation, the, the liberation of constraints is another one. So I think it's very interesting how you, but uh, I have chosen this, the plans and meters for specific reasons. And you know, plans, of course, is a, is a very typical uh, working instrument in architecture. But when it comes to meters, it could mean the measure of a meter, but it could also be what is in a, in a poem, you know, the meter, the rhythm of a poem, which I think is very interesting. And of course, our buildings need to have some kind of rhythm in how the sequences are uh, experienced as well. And paradoxes is something that we, I think we run into occasion or not occasionally, but constantly. And that's something to deal with. It's the, the thing that we cannot control, but that influences us in the most interesting ways. And I'll get back to that. But to start with the plan, and uh, this, I think this image was on the, I think on some poster or so, and this is from the crematorium in Stockholm, and this is evidently the plan of that building. And I will now tell you something of what I believe about plans, because uh, as I see it, the plan is the medium, the lens through which, depending on focus and field, everything can be scrutinized. It outlines the entire program uh, it formulates the, the, the formal characteristics of the spatial sequences. It makes it possible to develop how patterns of movement function. It reveals how the core differs from the periphery, how logistics can be incorporated or divided from rooms, as well as how pillars and columns may be um, uh, combined with walls or be freestanding and separate. And while simultaneously considering the volumes and the apertures of the rooms in the light of their surroundings, a complete overview of the spatial characteristics is attained. Included in a map uh, of a city or the terrain, a plan enables even wider contexts to be considered. The plan says it all. Its contents are equalized. In the proportions of the graphic figures, secondary and primaries are equals storerooms and boardrooms. The, the overall tone is the aim, as in a painting by Matisse, for instance, where int intermediate spaces are as important as the figures. The background and the foreground and the plan interact constantly. The work lies in developing perfect pitch. Proportions is everything. Shapes are calibrated and what they serve. At a certain point of balance, something happens. Transcendence, glimpse in the tangible. Like poetry, architecture has its stylistic features and figures uh, to achieve enhancement and degrees of subtlety. Reflections, reversals, or fragmentation to attain implicit strength. There are refined alternating patterns in lyrical poetry as there are in architecture. Distichs, tartan grids, or cesura like divisions in structures. And just as the wrong foot um, can be hopeless at the end of a line so of a poem, so can badly chosen dimensions offend in a series of rooms. So as I see it, uh, the two-dimensional abstractions of the architectural plans are not unlike the metrical patterns that distinguish poetry. Rhetorical figures that distinguish poetry or um, and rhyme and um, rhyme schemes can also be found in a figurative sense in the symmetries and diverse patterns of buildings. In other words, the plan regulates the building rather like poetry is regulated by its metrical structures. But what is really outstanding about the plan is that despite its intelligence, it still does not determine the appearance of the building. So if we should distinguish between building and architecture, if constructing, should we say, ordinary buildings is closer in practice 
to the freer approach of prose, to its words and syllables. Architecture, in its precision of figures and parts, offers the possibility of a kind of elevation uh, and the kind of resonance we find in poetry. So, some, some other plans before we get into the, to my, my works. Uh, so a few works uh, on why I choose these plans that evidently have a billion words written about them and spoken about them. Because I find my aims and interests continuously oscillating in the kind of dichotomy that seem to exist between the evident symmetrical rigor of the plan and shape of that of the Parthenon as to the equally evident, should we say, fragmentation or looseness of the Erecteion. The gravity of the Parthenon is, should we say, enlivened and brought to tension by the, uh, the understated intricacies of the corner contractions between the columns, you know, at the end of the, the um, facades. And the curvature of the stylobate as well, and the emphasis of the, the columns, uh, the inwards leaning, of course, of the columns and so on. So the, the rigor of this building has so much within it. And um, this, I think, influences my work. And it's the, the modernity is, to me, astounding. Louis Kahn's famous mother house project for the, in Connecticut, for the nuns in Connecticut in the 60s, is another strong proof of the power of the plan and the drawing. And as unusual as it is, it carries atmospheres, I would say, of the very distant past. And it has, as we know, also inspired contemporary architects, or at least James Sterling built the Wissenschaftszentrum in Berlin some decades back. I never know if Jim Sterling acknowledged his uh, predecessor, Louis Kahn. It was, maybe it was too close. Sometimes it's easier to to sort of, if you Picasso, of course, we knew how he spoke about his interest in the African masks and so on, but it's easier when something is way beyond in history. And then over to something more recent, this lovely plan by Reima Pietile, which is at the, very, at the very little corner, because all these drawings are on the same scale, and the Parthenon and the Erecteion are in the position they are at the, at the Acropolis. But this little wonderful building is is um, uh, built in the 1970, uh, early 1970 in Suvikumpu, just outside Helsinki. And the clever arrangement of this 100 square meter plan is virtuous, I would say, in any sense of the word. In spatial, in spatial terms, it sort of, you know, it has a very narrow entrance here. And, uh, oops, this was not so easy. Maybe I should be careful. Uh, so the entrance is very narrow, and this room at the corner, which is the living room, uh, somehow becomes sort of larger by this being so small. And also this, th this very compact um, plan has interesting features that we more sort of relate to buildings from maybe the 19th century, an apartment where there is a corridor at the center. I don't think this really works. The, uh, there's a corridor here, and then there are a number of uh, rooms dispersed out, but it's also very practical. You can say you come from the entrance, the kitchen is straight to the left, which is sort of someone, an architect with empathy, you could say, to, to host taking care of the house. And there's, at the recess at the center is actually a little here where there's um, the kitchen table. And then at the dark is the, is the bathroom. But what I think is particularly interesting in this plan is the way you could circulate. Because by circulating, a house can really change over time. And there could be a teenager who wants to sneak out in the afternoon or the evening without the parents in the living room seeing it. Or you don't want to meet the neighbors that come for, uh, on a visit. So this, the circulation possibilities, and I mean thinking maybe some of you saw the Ingmar Bergman, Fanny and Alexander film when they have a sort of a ring dance at Christmas. This is a very modern, very, uh, should we say, 70s apartment, but it still enables you to sort of be in, do numerous loops through the building. So, but the most stunning aspect of uh, 
of, um, or, or what should I say, to achieve what I just said in this minimal plan is no mean feat. And it indicates what discriminating empathy can accomplish in a plan. And uh, the interesting thing, I think, that the, the exterior is of secondary importance and lacks a certain interest is an observation not so much of the architect's talent for design as his understanding of what is essential. You see the exterior of the building down to the right on the image, and I'm, I think the plan is really virtuous. The, 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 uh, the facades are quite okay, but they are, like many facades, they are sort of, they are of the era, or they are the, of the whims of the architect, or they are, have to be in a certain way because of the surrounding buildings. But the, the wonderful is that the, the, if the facade belongs to the surroundings, the plan, on the other hand, determines the structure of the building and what it offers to those who live there. So, I've already touched on poetry, and I think that this uh, poet is very important to me, and he's a very interesting man who was really a uh, he was a modern, he was born 1907, died 1973. He was a truly radical in many ways, politically and socially and so on, but he wrote along the metrical rules of antiquity almost, or if it was the hexameters or the sonnet form and so on. And he, he said um, quite early something interesting that blessed be all the metrical rules that forbid automatic responses. Forces to have second thoughts and free us from the fetters of self. And this is a very interesting statement that could be of architecture as well. So now I will present uh, works that I have designed, and I will start with a few pairs of, to going a bit rapidly through a few pairs of buildings or works that have some affinity. In this case, it's reliefs, it's landscapes. And some other is about the constraints on the site. Another is about the domestic or housing. Then I will continue with three major uh, presentations, which is a church, a crematorium, and an ongoing work in Finland, close to the Alvaralto's famous Villa Mairea. But this is, a, in a way, a um, commemoration um, project for, for the Kurds in... Uh, in um, Iraq. I had traveled extensively in Kurdistan when I was a student, and I was invited by uh, uh, an artist in Sweden who had seen a photo of a bombed out Kurdid vill Kurdish village, and he wanted, and this is a project in Norway, and he wanted me to help him to elaborate how this could be used in some way. And I took this photograph and started sort of creating a kind of space which reminded me of what I had s experienced in Kurdistan, but also what I could distinguish from the photo. You don't see the photo here. But we did complete drawings, planner drawings, but also what is maybe most important are par partly the model, which was the final model after which it is built. But also there were, I designed sort of small fragments that was sort of left in these, uh, these, uh, in the photo, I could distinguish maybe up to the right is probably there was a water reservoir, I believe, and there were some other just walls left. And then I was also inspired, evidently, I recall by Leverens, the font in, oops, the font in uh, St. Petri in Sweden, which uh, has it sunk into the ground. And there was, in this photo, there were some slits in the ground. But I also, gave to this artist a kind of grammar or a grammatical layout how these, because we could not be there for every moment, but I designed so how the brickwork or stonework could be done with this in Swedish says track, um, frame, um, well, frame of another kind, and uh, then it has edge, and then it has grave. So there were sort of a, a little vocabulary of these easy stone parts. And this is just fragments of what, what was finally built, maybe now 20, 25 years ago. And it's the very powerful, uh, the up in the very north of Norway. This was a more or less at the same time as, an, as a building, an art center, an art gallery, Millis Gordon in Stockholm, which is in the outskirt on a, should we say, a well-to-do suburb. 
so here is also a bit like you see on the on the model to the right it's actually set this is a quite a well-known museum in Stockholm, an outdoor museum with terraces and large monumental sculptures. So to the left, you see the, st the columns and the, st the wide stairs of that. I sort of brought them into the building. So the building is a kind of reliefs and it has a kind of datum of the roof is completely horizontal. So what, is this, what uh, varies is the level of the floor where you walk. And then the horizontal roof is then perforated by, by skylights. So this is about uh, 1999, I think it was inaugurated, it was a competition. Most of the works that I will show you are competitions. And I think this building is somewhat of a contrast, but because many of my buildings have relatively austere, or should we say exteriors, uh, should we say, what would you say, esterni senza pretese. They are not so unassuming, I would say, in English. They are pretty low key, but this is a bit of a different building. This has copper on its roof, so this is a bit different. Here instead, the interior is white, it's more mute, and the outside is more elaborate with these refined materials, oak and so on. And this is the first exhibition, the Malevich exhibition, coming from, from Petersburg. Another art center at the very center of town, I think Goya mentioned it, it's the Bonnier Art Gallery for temporary, uh, temporary exhibitions. It's uh, set along the, the railway, and it's really a building which is a contrast to the, s the neighboring uh, building, which is, you see this sort of brick socko. I didn't want to extend the brick complex, but rather play with it. So it's a, it's a steel building, and uh, paradoxes I mentioned, and I will get back to it. This is one of the artworks in an early exhibition, which was supposedly sort of uh, not arte povera, but it was sort of n inexpensive. But in fact, it's a thousand scales from Ikea, and they are, when you have a thousand of them, it becomes, became the most expensive work in the whole exhibition. So paradoxes are frequent in art too, I think. And getting back to our precedents, I think that to me, Alberti is such an interesting, such an interesting uh, mind. And uh, I quote him frequently these days, also when all our clients speak about uh, sustainability. And I think Alberti said something, I don't know how he wrote it in, in, uh, um, in Latin, or I guess it was, but th this thing that the beauty is what enables or what the best preservation uh, way to preserve a building is to make it really beautiful so no one wants to change it. And I think this is a very, clever statement and it's it's very valid in our times as well but also of course this the greatest glory in the art of building is to know what is appropriate i think appropriate is a term which has become a bit should we say ridiculed in in my life i think but i think uh, the appropriate is really an important aspect then the drawing to me the drawing i'm mostly doing my work I, you know, i've told about the plans but also about the the drawing, I mean the sketching, my, my work comes from sketches, from ink sketches or lead sketches. And I'm a very, I'm, I think the drawings are so wonderful by a very small, even the plan, I wrote somewhere that the wonderful thing about a plan is that you could draw it in the sand when you're on the beach with your friends and then it's erased by the waves, the tide that sort of goes up on the sand. So it's the, the, the drawing, if it's in the sand or if it's, on a paper is, is so such an incredible uh, instrument. This is my primary instrument in our work. And this is, of course, a, a section from Tesenov, which I think is a, such a lovingly uh, done drawing. It has, has sort of everything for this house, which has this, the cellar staircase is just, you can see it's more maybe stone and it has a certain inclination. And then the other, the next staircase is a little different, and then the top to the attic is very steep. And then you even see how, what happens on the attic. And of course, the attic in a building is so, I mean, we know that the attic could be a trivial place where, or where you hang things, where you store things. It could be where someone sadly takes his life, or lovers meet. And, and I think it's so beautiful how this somewhat technical drawing has an indication on how it could be used. 
the sort of the architect. And then it's, you know, the little window, the little window there has some technical details and the measures. So I'm very much in love with those kind of drawings that are synthetic in bringing it all together. And of course, there was this discussion that he was, Tessino may be considered an, a kind of traditional person, but he was so interesting, he was so undogmatic. You know, there was this question of the flat roofs, which was so popular, should we say, in the late 20s in Germany and around the Europe. Uh, but he was, had this, he did not go for that, but he had an, an argument which I think is worth retelling. He said that the, if we had a dogma, should have a dogma of all the, the roofs being flat, it's like taking away five letters from the alphabet or something. It's like minimum, sort of limiting our modes of expression. He said that sometimes, and of course he did sometimes flat roofs, but the interesting thing, it was not a question of style or what he preferred. It was, he didn't want to limit the, the expression, the, the vocabulary of the architects. And I think that's, uh, that's how we need to consider issues that come up. And I think he's a, such a thinking man. This, of course, again, his great attention, this is a little house for, for I think, the returned uh, soldiers after the First World War. Even in this very simple buildings, he creates, you know, a lamp, uh, uh, a bench and, and these kind of details that he never is never uh, just uh, doing it in one way and in a very different way this this genius from Finland Albert Alto you know early on he was so inspired by the neoclassicist by uh, by Gunnar Asplund in Sweden for instance here he has a house that was never built with a kind of central atrium but this kind of tongue in the cheek where you see the upper floor uh, in the atrium, there hangs again a string like um, of, of uh, laundry. I think this is sort of a such a touching. It's sort of also it's comic in the wonderful sense. So these, and of co course, this building that was was built. This though was built maybe 40 years later or something in in Hansa Viertel in Berlin. And here again, you see this. It's not an atrium building. These are very modern modern spaces, but you see that each apartment has a kind of atrium that sort of is, is the nucleus of the plan. And I think this, oh, I'm sorry, this is such an interesting how there is a continuation in the ideas and, and the architectures. So now over to some small private houses. This is something built in Stockholm maybe 10 years ago. This is often how my work starts. It's a very steep slope, a northern slope. And there's, it's a quite a colorful. I had the original intention was that it should be clad, it should be inexpensive. So maybe could it be clad with aluminium, you know, gold eloxated aluminium? It never happened that that industry burned down. So <laughs> it was things happened, and they. But these these are the materials. Instead, we used glazed bricks in three different hues. You see to the left, they are because. I realized that if we just have one color of yellow, it would become a bit like a, what do you say, a psychi, a, a, a fridge. It would be sort of a bit cold or a bit dry, but having a few, a few uh, variations, it's much better. So this is the house which has then three use of, of glazed bricks. And uh, this house is really very much de developed from constraints, I think, when I was uh, young, when I was a student, I think constraint was always, you found them sort of a problem, that you had an idea what you wanted to do and the constraints, your idea didn't fit into the constraints. I would say that in, um, in an <laughs> in a other stage of life, you, I think I more sort of embrace the constraints because by, then you limit what you can do and you have more, you can go sort of more straight to what is realistic. And in this case, the constraints were very important. It's a very steep slope. So the recess that you see to the left is not to do a wonderful terrace, which it happens to be, but it was simply because the, there's a line, you know, above a certain meters above the ground and cannot be exceeded. So we couldn't have the top floor going all the way out to the, to the 
edge, so to say. And the recess on the lower floor is also because the neighbor who had sold off the property, he want, they wanted to have access with their car. So you could say this section, you'll see it shortly. And the plan is also that it's a very small site. And I, so I positioned the building just exactly six meters from the property line. And the property line, uh, the border was, had this inclination. So the building follows exactly the inclination. The, the shapes of the buildings is just following that. So you can say this building is very much developed from the constraints. Though, of course, with experience and with, with uh, certain, what do you say, certain things you enjoy. And I had then, as you see, the glazed bricks, but I didn't want to have glazed bricks on these very steep corners. They had to be cut, and I feel cutting a glazed brick it can crack up. It doesn't feel very good. So I felt that maybe it could be even wilder. It could be to have the unglazed brick on the corner. So there was, as you see here, there's it's just the, the unglazed yellow brick on the corner. And finally, I think Goya mentioned uh, Hermann Chesh, who's a a very, who's a good friend and a colleague and a mentor, or not a mentor, but a, someone who inspired me a lot. And he has done some wonderful buildings and restaurants in Vienna. And in this case, you see a very, the, the top floor with the sliding uh, glazed things. And then it has steel column. And the steel column felt a bit, when I was a student, you should be, you should be, um, Honorable, what do you say? You should be truthful and sh expose the materials that there are. But I felt that a steel column. What's the what's fun about showing a steel column there? So finally, I had the steel column just painted like the like the oak, the, the oak that is on the on the board. And people actually stand and touch it and think it's oak. And then when they touch it, they realize it's actually it's, it's a kind of trompe l'oeil. So this is the kind of things that can happen in buildings that I think is is part of the play. But then, oh, yeah, that's how you see how the recesses on the ground is because of the cars. The recesses on the top is because the, the height line from the authorities and the inclination and the plan is from the property edges. This is another project where the constraints are really important. Um, and you could, uh, you see to the right the house, which I had design the, the best thing on this, this is a summer house for a family, a wooden house of a very exclusive kind. The best thing on the property, because all the buildings had to be torn down, uh, the best thing was this chestnut tree that you see on the plan. And, oops, sorry. Uh, but uh, I realized I did an atrium house around this wonderful chestnut tree, but I realized that you know, if you have a hollow center at the building, the building expands, becomes big. And I knew that this municipality was a bit reluctant for new buildings close to the shore. So finally I said to the client, why don't we try to build exactly on the footprint of the existing? So what you see here are the memory of three of the building, the original building is the one on the top to the right. It's a small house and it had an addition of a uh, atelier of some kind or a workshop. And the, the, the further down is the tractor garage, but all of the, those are gone, but the, the exact, the new building is on the exact perimeter of those buildings. And then there's a new pool house for the left. And these are then situated, as I said, close to the sea and uh, are all in oak boards, painted or oiled a bit dark. There's also oil, um, oak on the roofs. And uh, so they are very, the um, the client and I think the neighbors hope that it would be very close to the surrounding area. So the the exterior volumes of the buildings are very truly traditional, even though the windows and an architect may distinguish that it's not so old. But the interior, on the other hand, is is very. In this case, this is the the biggest. This is the living room, a very sort of opulent kind of uh, double fireplace. And then next to it is actually the kitchen, which has a completely different fireplace, a kind of traditional, and this uh, deep recess in the window where their daughter wanted to be able to, to sort of sit and with her, her dogs and so on and, and keeping check on the garden. So this is just a few fragments. And then to shortly to um, 
um, apartment buildings. This is a tower in Malmö with a brick, and it's all in situ made brickwork. You see how we also work very frequently with full-scale mock-ups. I think Goya mentioned this, and we do this as much as we can. And often the developers, the, the contractors, are not so happy. They think it's expensive. But on the other hand, when you have 150 windows of a, or, and you need to have, you know, you get a kind of prototype on the window sills or the details. So in this case, after a while, they were very happy that we had these prototypes. We also tested the, you could see the, the mortar. We have a mortar which is very close to give a certain massive quality to the building. We have a, a mortar which is quite close to the brick. And this building is then, of course, at the time it was very common to have sliding windows in various positions. But of course, uh, an apartment buildings need to be efficient, not too costly. So the verticality and the arrangement feels quite appropriate, one could say. And, but as you see, the, in fact, uh, on the sideways, all the, the window openings are exactly the same. But I think that most people in the city will not think about it. But actually, as architects, we may distinguish it that the shift from the base to the shaft, there the windows are considerably higher. And also the two top floors are considerably higher than the rest. And this is something which has not to do that it should be seen. But I would say, or my thought is, the reason that it's designed this way is that if everything would be exactly the same, it would be very dry. I would say that our buildings, as rigorously effective they need to be, they also need to have a kind of should we say breathing, or they need to have a kind of nuances within them. So I think this, people will see this as repetitive, but in fact, it's something, it's also something else. And uh, yeah, this is how we work with, the, with um, detailing, and this is the, the, the drawing with a few, but it's really a big repetition, and the, what you see is also here the only articulation. I wanted to articulate the facades in some way, so there is a kind of recess on each side of these horizontal windows, which I would gladly acknowledge they are from someone, f you know, the, the Chicago architects, if it's Burnham and Root, and these architects are very present, I think, in this the way to do this. And um, so this has evidently quite a bit of patterns, and, but, and it's a big building, it has a, the, the brick, and also then to give some kind of uh, sensuality where you stop or where you sit down and wait for your family members. So there's a glazed sort of bench in the entry point. So there, the, the, it's not robust or it's not, should we say, austere for its own purpose. It's robust where it needs to be, but other points it needs to be essential, I'd say. And, but it has so much of patterns, so I thought I'd get back to, I mentioned my interest in poetry and the, 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 uh, the patterns that I think deals or that are present in architecture as well as in how you or arrange a poem. And I'll just give you a little example. Robert Frost was a very famous American poet who died in, I think, 1963. He was very old then, but he was a fantastic poet who wrote according to, and he and W.H. Auden were somewhat, in some ways similar, though Auden was much younger. But he wrote a poem that I has just 16 lines. It's a very simple poem, I'll read it for you. It has 16 <coughs> lines where the rhymes, the rhyme scheme is like the first quatrain, the first four has one rhyme, the, the, the second has another, and then it goes on. And, but every third line in each quatrain sort of takes up the new rhyme that comes back in the following Quatrain, and this is so, is so cleverly done, and of course, and this is a poem which is called Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening. It's very famous. Children all over the United States learn this at school because it's so simple, but it also has nuances of more uh, other things as well. But it goes like this. I'll, I'll, so Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost. Whose woods these are, I think I know. His house is in the village, though. He will not see me stopping here to watch his woods fill up with snow. My little horse must think it queer to stop without a farmhouse near, between the woods and frozen lake, the darkest evening of the year. 
He gives his harness bells a shake to see if there's some mistake. The only other sounds the sweep of easy wind and downy flake. The woods are lovely dark and deep, but I have promises to keep and miles to go before I sleep, miles to go before I sleep. So this is a very, maybe not in Rome, but it's a very well-known poem in the United States for, should we say, a generation a little older than mine. Here you see how it's, it's written, but of course it doesn't, a poem should work. It's not a technicality, but of course you need to, just with architecture, we have the tricks of the trade, not that it should sort of hit someone in the head to see them, but rather it should be as a kind of a, something which enables things to happen without being seen. I think this is a good example in poetry. So another building is from the same time as the high rise there is in Malmö in the south of Sweden. It's a brick, evidently a more horizontal brick building with a few, uh, should we say, it's a, two, two colors of brick and the recesses, the balconies has actually glazed bricks because there you are closest to the, so you don't wanna rub your skin. But this, and this I think as I just said, this, I think this is a wonderful, I think of the, uh, what is say, the Lari de Bicicleta. This is, has a kind of an atmosphere of, of, of the 30s in some way. And it's, it's in a very industrial part of Malmö. But it's a building which is pretty uh, robust evidently. And I think that most buildings needn't, when I said that, um, sort of esterni senza pretese, it's sort of, the, the importance is that things, buildings are good where you come close. And in this case, here is much more like nuances of painterly qualities where the greens and the different the colors of the windows. And the, so for those who get in, there is a kind of sense of care. But for those at a bit of a distance, it's more of a graphic or something, it's a volume. This is another building, also very efficiently distributed the plan. It has four staircases for 98 uh, apartments. And here you just see another treatment with glazed bricks on some parts, only half, because we couldn't afford too much of glazed bricks, but you see how it sort of makes this passage a bit more light. So, so with that, I'll go over to the, as I said, the, some works with some more um, detail. And this is a, a church, uh, what a competition, as many of these works are, a competition from, from um, maybe 15 years ago. Uh, it's a suburb of Stockholm. This very much like how the suburbs looked in, in uh, Stockholm in the, should we say, 40s and 50s. So all over the, the town it looks like this. And this is a parish, a parish building to the, which, so the church is technically an extension to this. And this is an interior. It should be a small, it's a small church. It should hold 190 um, uh, people. And um, so, the, but the building that you saw, that is very low. And maybe you'll see a plan. No, you don't see a plan. But I could say that this, when I started doing this church, I mean, you know, our whole history of architecture is, is built on churches and palazzos. So you have too many too many references, so how do you go about it? And I had these ideas of wonderful uh, skylights bringing in down light from some, or secluded skylights, and I was, you know, of course all over Italy there is these fantastic Baroque churches with this, and I was thinking also of, of the, uh, what is it called, San Pietro in Montorio, the, the Raimondi Cappelle, Cappelle Raimondi, which has a, a very tiny slit. There are windows that seem to light the place, but then there is, uh, there's the apse and then the altar and then there's a very tiny slit of a, of a vitrina which brings in light in a magical way. And this was things that sort of I had in mind, but you have to kill your darlings to not to overdo things. This is a Stockholm suburb. And uh, so that was why I sort of sobered up and you see, I, f I finally felt maybe I should try to do ordinary windows. So you see these are what, what came and so here is the building connected to the very low parish building so that and actually the client had asked me I had made a separate building quite a inexpensive building separate from the parish building but the client when I'd won the competition the client 
asked me or even urged me to, could you, could you fuse the two, make them sit together? Because then when there's snow and the rain and the elders that are in the social part, they want to go over to the church, the sermon. So then I felt it was interesting. It was a, I hadn't designed that, but I felt it made it even more interesting because I could sort of create a complex whole by having a church like a, like a monastery who has a church and a courtyard or a, you know, a garden and these things. So I was happy with this. Um, and here you see the, the plan of the building. It's a very small church. And the church is about 15 by 15 meters. And it has three small cap chapels. And those were not really in the brief, but I felt that they would be, by, by the proportion in the plan of these small spaces, they are what would make the small but most important space feel big. Because, in fact, the, the church is not much bigger than the parish hall in the neighboring building. And this is how it looks. I had never, I had tested all kinds of uh, sketches of facades, but I, I usually shy away from two uh, idol-like um, uh, exteriors. So it was only when I found out that the interior maybe needed more, more uh, uh, wall that I took away one of the windows because otherwise there were two windows on each side. And then I wanted to somehow embellish this kind of boxy space. So I started designing these uh, benches on two sides, but then I found that they could go all around the building. And as it... Um, and then a few, but then I had sort of, uh, sorry, I had uh, this, the, the, there was no intricate skylights. There were only large windows, about five meters high. And then came how to do the window. And I had an idea first of a very simple double beam at the center, but it felt slightly too orthodox for my taste, somehow too strict. And then I had an idea there could be a, two beams northwest and two south, uh, north-south, and that would create a cassette, sort of a, a square cassette roof, which would have been very workable. I'm sure certain colleagues would have chosen that, but I feel it was too, too rigorous, too uh, stiff in some way. Then I found another wor version that I was <coughs> very happy about with two gigantic beams five meters high that created three aisles in this tiny little little chapel. But again, you have to realize that don't overdo it. So finally, I capitulated. This is how my work is constantly, that's what happens. I don't know how to do things. So I, so I then scribbled a few beams in odd um, positions, and I realized that finally the maybe this could be worth testing. So we did a big model of this, and this is finally what was built. And uh, yeah, here you see it. So this, uh, and this church was maybe the first time we used, we tested glazed bricks. So the walls here are actually massive load-bearing walls. They are 85 centimeters thick, but I didn't want to, to overstress the gravity of the, the walls. And uh, so, as you see, the windows, they have a recess. Maybe you saw it on the plan. They have a sort of a lateral recesses, cavities almost, where almost there's a bodily measure. There are 35 centimeters, so they're not just a slit. They're actually has a, there's a space to it. So all these windows have, have these kind of recesses, whereas one window where you can orientate yourself. I didn't want all the windows to be too high up, so you just saw the clouds. It's nice to be able to distinguish on what level you are and if it if it's uh, uh, how it is outside so but there there you see the cladding there is the glazing is the cladding but the walls are actually massive but for swedish for the regulations we need to have um, um, insulation which is a bit ironic or because you know this kind of structure could last for 500 years or who knows 1000 years but whereas the insulation the rock wall insulation maybe it crumbles in 50 i, I don't know so this is a bit funny but but it was an interesting uh, work i also suggested that they should not blast away all the bedrock that was on the site 
but rather, this is, of course, we know quite common today, that you take away everything that's there and you fill it up with small stones, and then you cast concrete. We instead drilled a few holes and put some steel rods in and then cast the concrete foundation. So to the left, you see that this is the horizontal section through the wall with the recesses that are both on the sides and on the lower part. And this is how it looks. The, the, the lamps, we had actually designed lamps previously. They were already pr procured and everything was, but I found that they were a bit too interested. They were brass and they were, and then I happened to be in Barcelona. I was meeting Jordi Garcés who designed the Picasso Museum and he showed me his new extension in the, in the courtyard which had this library and they had some of these lamps but much larger. And I felt that maybe was an interesting lamp. I didn't, and then he said, do you know who designed them? And I said, no. Well, Cesar Vieira, he says. So, so these are Cesar lamps that we finally, and they, some, some priests in the house think they are too dull, they think they're like street lamps, but I thought they were much more in tune with the, with the space. So this is from the outside, this is the entrance. And a few of the details, the procession cross and the lectern where you can sort of uh, where you can uh, screw it up by by uh, hand you know we have designed occasionally a conference building then you have maybe today you have electricity or a microphone you press a button and it says bzzz, it goes up and down and uh, here i knew that the the bishop who was going to inaugurate she was very short and some priests are high so it had to be dealt with but i felt it was sort of nicer that the the priest would actually kneel in front of the congregation to sort of roll it up. And uh, then there's a piece of, of stone. This is the font in the room. And tessellated a piece of the marble into the brickwork. The brick is the Columba brick uh, from the Peters and the Danish. And this is one of the small chapels that are really quite small. And this was actually a mistake. It was not meant to be only brick, but there was a some confusion and I said to the Masons, this looks beautiful because it was really an unadorned brickwork that is so rare. If I would have said to them, do the brickwork really fine, it would have been too delicate. Now instead it was sort of a proper work. And this is the children's chapel. I designed some chairs here. You know, in, in Scandinavia there are wonderful chairs by Alvar Aalto that are bent wood and they are quite technically advanced, but they are lovely. But I felt in this very basic church it would be nice to have more, should we say, uh, elementary furniture. So these chairs are, the, the verticals are 42 millimeter, the horizontals are 21, and it's almost like a ladder so the smallest child can sort of climb up the ladder to sit by the table which you don't see in the image. Yeah, so finally, or not finally, but the following is the crematorium, which you already saw, the plan. And you know, the plan is, there's a public entrance at this corner, and the undertaker's cars, they drive in on the other side. And then, sorry, then there is a, the, the incinerator hall, the oven are here, and the cold stores are here, and the small part is where the reception is, and the director has the rooms and the changing rooms for those working. So the people who come to be present for a cremation, they would, they would come here under the canopy and they would go in. I don't know. They would go in here and go into a room which is the ceremony room. So the building is set in a wood, and it's the Woodland Cemetery. By designed by Leverance and Asplund in about, nine, they won this competition in 1916. So this building, it was a competition. There were many schemes by very uh, elegant linear buildings. There were Tadao Ando and there was uh, Caruso Sindian who had very elegant buildings. But, but, and I had started with very, also with a linear building. This is the site with a photo from 1940 and it still looks very much like this. It started as a kind of national romantic, very much wood, but then it became more of an open, almost a southern landscape. And this I th could be inspired by Kaspar Kaspi David Friedrich's painting, you know, outside Dresden, there's a famous painting. 
and this is the area. But what inspired me was somehow an early aspirin work, or not even the chapel, you know, the forest chapel, the Capella de Bosco, whatever you call it. The, the, but next to it is a morgue, the cellar where you keep the corpses. And that somehow was in the, w the ground that was, I'd seen this many times as I'm from Stockholm, but I'd never, when I did this competition, it had some other relevance to me. Another building which is from, of course, 19, about 23, is Leverance Resurrection Chapel, which is such an extraordinary building and so important also to Asplund when he was doing the city library, the Stadsbibliothek in Stockholm. And this, uh, I could, I cannot take the time, but I could just show you the floor paving. It has a lovely floor paving where you enter from this side through the peristyle and you enter here. And then here could be the coffin and here's kind of altar. And then you go out on the other, on this side. But the paving with the mosaics on the floor is, I mean, it has very ancient connotations, but it's also almost like waves. And if you think this is the river Styx to, in Hades, this is really, I mean, Leverance was so reticent, but it's still so many possibilities of interpreting his works. I think this is just one of those many examples. In this case, I started my work with sketches, as I always do, and they're not that they're beautiful, but they're a way to sort of get into the, to the, to the job. And this, there was, you know, this, the, we say for you could be the selva scura of, of this cemetery. It's really a, you know, it's a forest not with leaf trees so much as mostly pine trees. And I felt that when you come there as a mourner, should you go on your own in the wood or should you go by the road? I felt better by the road. And then I'd studied many solutions with very linear building that could be interesting, but I found they were practically not very good because there are very few people working in the building maybe four or five people, and then there are undertakers coming with their cars, and then there are mourners coming, so if it's a long building, it's, it's not so practical. So I found it better to do a more compact building. And of course, the, the transparency of a linear building can be exciting, and you can sort of the length of it, but I found that, you know, the kind of, the massive block of a building has other features. It could be very practical, also it could be should we say almost enigmatic in how you, you know, a bit labyrinthine and how you, it has none of the transparency and the outlooks of the long slender building, but it does have other qualities like the, like the enigmatic qualities. And this was how I, speaking of rhymes, this is something that I frequently come back to that in early stages of buildings, I tend to you know, you have a few windows in a position that you may like or so. So there are some rhymes that may for a while make the project good enough. And in this case, I found that there could be an atrium courtyard for the staff in, with a certain measure, eight by five meters or something, sorry. And then I found that the canopy that is here that has some huge pine trees that should be preserved, that could have the same measure. So this was a kind of visual rhyme, if you like, or the rhyme and the plan that for me was quite important at some point. And uh, you could see here how this canopy was a wooden canopy for the beginning, and it had this, this tree projecting through. But then as I worked on it more and I won the competition, I had other knowledge Then we I could create a plan that was more, should we say, more in tune to the, the practicalities and also the rhyme, it was like the, the poem didn't, the, the meter had taken over and the rhyme was sort of redundant. And so now the, the, as you see there's only a slit here that brings down daylight on this wall, which I think is, is actually better. So this is a, almost like a sunken pyramid it's a, it's a, with a few openings. A slit, a very tiny slit. Uh, uh, which is in the ceremony room. But apart from that, there are some very large windows, but there are these other schemes had much more advanced light arrangements. But I felt that in this very, should we say, tough wood, it needed a building that was a bit not too delicate. 
And it could easily have been stucco, but that would have been a bit brittle in the, among the pines. It could also have been concrete. It could be in situ cast concrete. But I felt the building would then be too strong. It would be like a stealth bomber, or it would be sort of over strong. So I felt, finally, I chose brick late in the process because somehow it resonated the bark of these pines. It's a pretty superficial reason, you could say. Some students say to me, ah, oh, it's very cool, it's a very heavy building. But it, it actually, the, the cladding came very late. I worked on the plan for months, but the, the, the facade was late. And here is the, in the original canopy, I'd kept a tree, retained a gigantic pine of two, three hundred years. But I realized that probably building close to it, maybe the water will leak away, so it will die. And so finally, I also rearranged with a slit of light. And then, as you see, the, the tree is no longer there, but I sort of substituted the, the real tree for a petrified tree, a granite column, simply, which is a load-bearing column. Whereas on the other hand, this, it's an 11 meter span, it should have had a column too, but there is actually a steel beam in the, under the roof, because I wanted the generosity to those coming there. Yeah, well that's the, and this is the door to Hardest, if you like, it's the door to the, no, it's never meant to be used, it was not in the brief, but it was something that is, uh, that is used for, for, uh, um, can be used occasionally for technicalities, but it was, I wanted this as a sign that there's something happening behind that wall. And then this is then the place where people can gather. I felt in this kind of building, maybe you want to be not too close to other people, you are there in grief, so maybe you need a bit of space to, to sort of have some, some, uh, uh, should we say some uh, time on your own or being able to reflect. So this is the, how it's set in the woods is really, and this cemetery is actually open all day and all night. So it's, it's um, people are passing through. It's not a closed off place. And so we try to retain as much trees as close to the building as possible. And then you see a few uh, walkways up to the building that are the pavings. And these are evidently very much inspired by Piccioni's, Dimitri Piccioni's, you know, the, the extraordinary uh, Greek architect who built uh, many buildings in Athens and, uh, and especially the pavings up to, well, to the Acropolis, but even the one to the Filippapo Hill and the little pavilion and the um, Lovardiaris uh, Chapel as well. So he's an important inspiration for me throughout my for decades and this is because they could they needn't be really a garden next to this building it would be a bit too sweet in this rough wood so I felt just laying out the, the pavings around the trees would be sort of enough again what is appropriate here there are wonderful small secluded gardens by Asplund's crematorias a few hundred meters away but they are in a different situation here it's really in the woods. And these are a few windows. Of course, the windows has one possibility. You see out, you see when the fox is running by, you see the wind. Whereas the skylights, the, what brings down light is actually a few, not skylights, just windows on the roof that are then positioned close to these reflecting glazed bricks. And then there is, there is uh, actually uh, a marble floor, which was discussed by the client because this is a municipal project, not, a, not an expensive project. They said, that should go. You should take away your glazed bricks. You know, they were very rough on me. And, but luckily, I had time and to write them and argue. I said, I could save, we could save some pennies for now, but for, for a century or for many decades, it will be so much poorer environment. So luckily, my client stuck, stuck with these because this is a, quite a technical space, but it's also, of course, a ceremonial space because the mourners should be able to, to be close to the, to the ovens or the incinerators. So it's a kind of Swedish marble, glazed bricks that are perforated because there is a kind of 
rumble. There's a kind of uh, uh, noise from the incinerators. And uh, this is then this tiny little cellar, which is the, the room where you could bid your relatives farewell. Uh, either there could be an open coffin, you could sit around, or you can come back when the cremation has taken place and then you could put the urn on top of this, uh, this uh, little postament there. And then there's some, a few lighting. I worked on these, the interiors of this for a long, long time. I'd used up all the money and I should have some lighting and certain lighting needed to be adjustable. So that's the rig you see. But to the right is simply a brass a piece, a console, a brass console put on the roof with th th three candle, brass candle holders. And I thought in the end, Maybe that was just about right. It needn't be more than that. It needn't be an interesting, uh, an interesting lamp. And this, both regards this building and the, the church, has been a major issue. Not to, it's, it's a risky thing to make. It could be theatrical. You know that a church becomes theatrical, or this kind of space becomes too pretty. So, so finding this level is really that has been most of the job, I would almost say, to find the right uh, solution. This is this little courtyard where the, the, those who work they can go out and have a coffee or smoke without sort of meeting those who are there in grief. And this is then the drive out from the, from the, where the undertaker's cars drive out. Either they, but they, that takes a while to slide it up if there's some emergency, they could take this little door that is there as well. So, and, uh, but as I said, the brick was, the brickwork was really something that came late and had more to do with the, the surroundings. The techn because this is a quite contemporary building. It has a concrete structure clad with brick and insulation, where the church is a massive load-bearing structure with no expansion joints or anything like that. So this work, and here you see it from, from on top, but I think this work, I, when I was working on it, I had this interest, and as I always have, in, in poetry and in, uh, in rhymes, and I showed you this kind of rhyme, the visual rhyme of the, t the courtyard and the opening in the canopy. This was something that I felt was a rhyme, but then, as I said, the, after a while, the meter had taken over and didn't need rhyme, and you know, because rhyme is a sort of medieval invention in a way, and uh, whereas the ancient poetry of, of uh, Greece was sort of hexameters, that was sort of other, but there was not rhymes. And uh, maybe Petrarca, what do I know, started the rhymes. And, but I was thinking then of, of the terza rima of, of Dante, of course, which I think Guya mentioned. I think this is so touching how he, how he made this arrangement of his poem that makes it easy, easy to, to read, easy to remember even. And uh, you know you know all this, but to me, even to a, to a uh, North European, it's easy to remember the, with the, nel mezzo del cammin de nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva scura che la dritta via era smarita. E quando a dir qual era e cosa dura, questa selva selvaggia e aspra e forte, se nel pensiero non la paura. Tanto e amara, c'è poco e più morte, e per trattare al bence vi trovai dire delle altre cose, ci vo scorte. E io non so ben di come io ventrai, tanto era pieno di sonno a quel punto che la verace via abbandonai. Poi ci io fui dal piede un colle giunto, laddove terminava quella valle che m'avea di paura il cor compunto. And you know, this, the, the, it's so. The repetition, the intelligently, I mean, I was showing the frost thing, which is so simple. This is so much more advanced and so long. And, but it's also interesting what the pattern does to the, because I was saying rhyme and reason, you never know, and the, the sort of the, the double imperative or the, the function or the, or the shapes is sort of interesting. And in this case, you can read, if you just go a little bit further into the, can, the first canto of of La Comedia, you can hear how, how uh, Dante is writing, e quale quei ci volontieri acquista, e giugno il tempo 
che perdere lo faccia. Eh, in tutti i suoi pensieri piange e sta triste. Tal mi fece la bestia senza pace, senza pace, eh, che venendo mi incontro poco a poco, mi ripigneva laddove il sol tace. And then, of course, you have um, facce, perdolo facce, uh, pace and tace. And it's a bit wild for a, a poet to say that the sun is mute, that there is because the sun may not shine or may be obscured, but to say that it's mute. And I was thinking when I read this that how, how does the guy have the nerve to sort of to write that the, the, the sol tace? And I think frequently in our work, we get our inspiration and we have our alibis from someone ancient. And in the case of Dante, you know, he said about Virgilio, he said that, again, in the Commedia, he says something like, uh, to se lo mio, uh, maestro, mio autore, uh, tu se lo solo colui qui uh, tolsi um, lo bello stilo che mi ha fatto onore. So he was really, of course it was 1500 years later, so it was easier maybe than for Jim Sterling to acknowledge uh, Louis Kahn, what do I know? But I think it's sort of interesting how maybe because if you read this Qualiquete Volunteer Acquista and those lines where il sol tace, there's actually a p section where you, if you read the uh, Virgilio's Eneid, uh, you can come to a point, and you know, already early in the, in the work, he says that, you know, the Trojan horse was the thing in Troy, and he says, Atenedor, there was this island outside of Troy, and the, and the warriors had they had left, but in fact they had they had just gone away, and the Odysseus and the other warriors were in the horse. And then Virgilio writes something like Atenedo uh, Tasitae per Amica Silencia Lunae. So there was I mean I of course Dante knew Virgilio by heart. And this is something where his, his hero says that there was the silent, the benevolent um, silence of the moon. So it had already been sort of worked out a thousand years before in, in Virgilio's work. So this is just funny how things reoccur. And, and that's, uh, to me, quite touching. And I was recalling this when I was working on the crematorium, not that it has anything except for the Selva Scura with, to do with Dante. So, uh, this work is something ongoing. It's a complete contrast, as you will see, to the, to the, to the previous works. It's an art center. It was an also an international invited competition. Uh, it is, we have not now, it's not built yet, but it will shortly be built. It's situated by a little river where the logs were coming and the client, our client, is actually the client who built the Villa Maria, the famous building that Alvaralto designed in about 1939. They became very rich from buying this property in 1870 and making an old, um, industry, an old place into a sawmill, and that created great wealth. And long afterwards, Mayre Gulliksen, who was born in this family, she collected art, she was an artist of sorts in the beginning, and they had seen Alvaralto's own private house in about 1935 in Helsinki, which is a fantastic building. And uh, they had invited him to build their director's home on this place. But there were se several other buildings, because here you see how it is. It's another, you know, this is Scandinavia, a lot of fir trees, and there's this little river, and there is a rapids, about three or four meters, so that's where the wheel was sort of running. And, but the wealth of this client made them build a kind oops, sorry, a palazzo in wood, very close to the water. And there was an, and you see the sort of life at the turn of the century with a bathing house and so on. But so it was in this tradition that Alvaralto was brought in because there was another house, a very, an Art Nouveau kind of villa, 1901, but this, so Alvaralto was involved to build a new house, which is up to the left here. What you saw, here is the old sawmill, 
Here is our, the new art center, and the river runs here, and the 1901 building is here, but the Alvarado's house is in, right in the Villa Maria, in the woods, actually. And, uh, but here you see how all the, the previous building, the little palazzo, the wooden palazzo, and the headquarters all have some kind of Baroque gardens, almost. So I suggested that the, our building should have one big open sculpture uh, garden in front on the south, whereas the building would be situated very close to the water. But these are a few fragments for those of you who do not know Alvar Alto's house. It's possible to visit occasionally. It's a magnificent building. I've used it for my students so many times. It has, it is, it's a conglomerate of so many interesting things, but it's fused together with the utmost talent. Uh, it's a, it has you know, interiors with delicacy and oriental features, but it also has sort of cubistic, there's a fireplace which is like a, a three-dimensional Juan Gris or something. It's really extraordinary. And you see the colders and the bathroom. When you enter, they have Rodin uh, dancers on aquarelles. So it's, everything is in the house. And uh, yeah, well the detail on everything is... It's not over the top, but it's just about right. And for this, for the art center, in the competition, I worked for months before and with the drawings, and I had a few ideas that maybe the, the hall shouldn't be all the same. There could be one hall which could have a curvature, maybe with a sort of a more generous ceiling and a entresol upstairs. And another hall could have just a horizontal, uh, because there should be banquets. This building should, it's both a very public building, but it's also for this client. They have meetings, so there should be for banquets for 250 seated guests, which is a large crowd, you know, to serve 250 people. Is, so I felt they should not be seated too, in a too high space. It could be better to be a space which had horizontal, a horizontal ceiling, but in fact having a huge wall for artworks where the where the skylight is a bit secluded, as I told earlier, because here the skylight is not really seen by those in the room. They rather see out over on the, on the water. So on top is a little early sketch of my idea for an expanse on the south, which where there could be picnics, people could gather, or a little pond where children could play, or they could play with kites and so on. But it's really one big open, oops, it's not really so easy. There's one big open space here with a floral garden, a kitchen garden, and then some hedges on the side that sort of divide off. And uh, this is the, the character of the building, which is not so alien from the sawmill building nearby by the rapids, which has a sort of a barn shape. This is a little more, I wanted it not too close to that, so it's a little more exotic. It has sort of an inclination on the lower part but it's really a wooden building all through, and it sits very close. So here is a canopy. To the left is a canopy under which you can sit in the midnight sun or almost midnight sun, enjoying the, oh, sorry, the summer weather. And this is how it's located close to the water. And you see the bridge where the old sawmill and the water wheel is. And... Uh, here is just one of those sketches that because the, so the south side has no openings to the art spaces because they want to have a more stable light. So I felt that in the evenings, the building would really light up the surroundings by the skylights that are all directed north. So that would reflect in the, in the water and so on. And then there will be some children's, uh, children's atelier out in the garden. I spoke to a museum person that I know and she said that Johan, every, nowadays every museum must have a children's sort of atelier. So this is out in the garden, a little study for this. And these are how the sections are. Like I said, the, r the low roof, not so low, four meters, and it looks, overlooks the water. And then there's the skylight here. And a few sketches then, then the, this is started as a very linear building went over to, I realized that it should face both the south garden and the, the north uh, waterway. And uh, so it should also be possible to rotate. 
It's a long linear building in some from the outside, but it actually is a way you could do loops in many, many variations without ever coming back. You could go from one end of the building to the other and then back without ever coming back in the same space, which I thought was uh, interesting. So here is the entrance is at the center and you have a double height space there and a bookshop and a few things. Oh, sorry. And there's a restaurant to the left, but the big hall where there are banquets is here with a little canopy and it has a, a um, to make it all a wood building, the beams couldn't be longer than this, so there's a wooden column, which is really a column at the center of the, not at the center, but in a, in a central position on the space. And then there are one space where it has no, doesn't look out to the building, small cabinets, and one space which overlooks with two sort of eyes into the, into the garden. And you will have a few so this is sort of an idea, if this great group of 250 people assemble in winter time, maybe they will skate on the, in front of the building on the big expanse on the south. And this, the top floor has also a tiny little, you see to the left, a tiny little uh, space, a dining space, where they could, a uh, confidence kind of dining space, which looks like something like this. I felt like, if you go to Montefeltro's uh, Palazzo in Urbino, you can come to the Studiolo. Where there's a t very tiny sort of, it's also nice in these big spaces to have intimate spaces, though not for studying, but for, and this is sketches of the dining, the banquets. And that's that space, which then overlooks the water, but also has a, the skylight bringing down light, but somewhat secluded for most of the people that are in the room. And this is the space that overlooks the courtyard with recent artworks by Finnish, a Finnish woman artist. And this is the one which has no views to the exterior, but it's more like an atelier um, connected. You see the grand piano in the, in the curved place. And this is how it looks, the building on the edge where there's the, the, um, the restaurant. And this is the top floor with this tiny little um, terrace overlooking the, and there is, so there is a little attic on top of the building where certain things can happen, sort of smaller artworks may be exhibited there. So with that, I'll just finish with one, oops, sorry. Maybe it starts again. Uh, the, maybe that's enough for <laughs> so uh, I don't I don't get it to work I thought I got it to work but we did it before. yeah we did it before. now it should work yes thank you yeah. so this is just how we work in we work in these full scale one to one models this in fact is a model which is one to twenty five and it's not at all for presentation such as this, but we study different parts. You see certain parts are wood. S this is the entrance, the bookshop, and the reception. So it's, a it's about 4.2 meters long, the model, so it's a bit hopeless to move it to the client, to show it to the client, but, but we did it. And uh, even you could see across the water, someone in the office took some photos and, and uh, enlarge them and put them outside the hall. So this, we're coming into the banquet room, which is a art space mainly, but, and this we feel is a very, that's the column, the wooden, the gigantic wooden column at the center of the room, an obstacle in a way, but it also it says how it's built. This is this little um, projecting out. There will be some fireplaces And you will see, yeah, so this is the entresol. There could be, there could be parties here. There could be uh, some kind of plays as well. And I thought that, I mean, this is Alvarado territory, you could say. And I touched upon the, on the, the other areas, uh, the Italian, so. But I thought I'd finish with, with one little piece that was written by Orden, which is called Archaeology 
because I've been touching on precedence several times, and this is actually the very final poem by W. H. Auden from 1973. It's called Archaeology. And in the beginning, he was really rigorous. He, he worked with, meet, with meters of different kinds. In this, it's more like a conversation. So, Archaeology by W. H. Auden. The archaeologist spade delves into dwellings vacancied long ago, unearthing evidence of life ways no one would dream of leading now, concerning which he has not much to say that he can prove. The lucky man. Knowledge may have its purposes, but guessing is always more fun than knowing. But we do know that man, from fear or affection, has always graved his dead. What disaster the city, volcanic effusion, or effluvial outrage, or a human horde agog for slaves and glory is visually patent. And we're pretty sure that as soon as palaces were built, their rulers, though glutton on sex and blanded by flattery, must often have yawned. But do grain pits signify a year of famine? And when a coin series petters out, should we infer some major catastrophe? Maybe, maybe. From murals and statues, we get a glimpse of what the old ones bow down to, but cannot conceit in what situations they blushed or shrugged their shoulders. Poets have learned us their myths, but just how did they take them? That's a stumper. When Norsemen heard thunder, did they seriously believe Thor was hammering? No, I'd say, I'd swear that man has always lounged in myths as tall stories. Their real earnest has been to grant excuses for ritual actions. Only in rites may we renounce our oddities and be truly entired. Not that all rites should be equally funded. Some are abominable. There's nothing the crucified would like less than butchery to appease him. From archaeology, one more at least may be drawn to wit that all our school textbooks lie. History is nothing to vaunt of, being made as it is by the criminal in us. Goodness is timeless. Thank you. So now it's going to be quite a difficult task because it's quite late. We don't have so much time, but uh, I'm sorry, I no, 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 no. It's the opposite. <laughs> it's the opposite. But uh, while we were uh, uh, hearing to this conference, uh, we were all speaking and talking and discussing yeah, yeah. about. Uh, uh, so many, so many points that arises from the conferences. So, I think the best is if, uh, first of all, uh, I will start with the thank you, <laughs> thank you, not 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 uh, not just uh, me, but on behalf of uh, everybody who is here tonight. Uh, thank you because you decided to um, illustrate uh, your work, many different works. Uh, uh, not by describing the works, uh, uh, but uh, more by um, sharing with us the process uh, of the design work. And this to me has a very, very important uh, role uh, and is a very actual, it's a very contemporary uh, matter. You have, uh, in, a, in, a, in a way, you decided to brought everybody of us uh, through this very, sometimes complicated, never linear path, which uh, uh, brings uh, um, to the translation of uh, an, an idea to a, built, uh, to a built body. So I thank you really for this uh, uh, approach. I think we are uh, in one of the best uh, place in Europe uh, to discuss uh, about the importance uh, 
of the process uh, in the artistic field because we are here in the place where the three arts uh, based on the drawings, which is uh, our tool uh, for the process, uh, are, um, are together. We, uh, we are here with, uh, uh, with painting and, and sculpture and architecture. So uh, I think it's really a claim uh, that uh, architecture is uh, uh, in its own right an art. And this is not very common to be here nowadays. Uh, so I think it's very important to, to speak about this. And, and I, I, I go across to, to a question. And this very non-linear and complicated path which lead from the idea to the, um, to the built work uh, is guided both by internal motivation by rules as we have seen with the metaphor of the of the poems uh, that you have uh, um, so beautifully explained uh, and but it's also guided by external influences so we we as architects we are yeah. in between yeah. these two um, these two tension and uh, I remember I'm, I'm sorry not to have him here because I don't know if he's translated in English uh, I remember the uh, the words by Luigi Pareson, which is a, a very important uh, Italian philosopher, uh, who reflect about the artistic process and uh, sorry, the artistic expression, and he states that uh, the um, the best artists are the one who can uh, um, create, uh, to can find the coherency between. Uh, the will of the artist and the will of the material. So we have seen here a great experimental work that you have uh, done to, through the years uh, about materials, uh, uh, about bearing materials, about cladding materials. We have seen, for example, different ways of, of using bricks as, as, as a bearing material or as a cladding. So this, uh, to me, is deeply connected to a very Nordic act attitude in building construction, which is, connect which is connected to craftsmen. So is it possible nowadays in the 21st century to affirm that there is this uh, craftsman part of our work? <laughs> and, and probably this image that we have here on, on, on the back, which is the, the image of a mock-up that you have built a scale one to one, uh, to, to discuss with the, uh, with the constructor about uh, the choice of this, uh, uh, this brick. Yeah. So, so is it something that we can discuss about? I don't know. I, it's, uh, I, wish, uh, I wish one could say or say to you that this, these things are possible, these are, uh, th that in Scandinavia this is a, a trend or a, a tradition, but I, I think of my work as you try to you try to do the best in each situation and you try to you, you often you cannot tell the client how laborious the situation will be because if you tell them or if you do a very big mock-up you cannot tell them well the full-scale mock-ups they have to pay evidently and they have to be a contractor but many things we do we cannot really tell everything in the beginning because it's only when they see the result they value its worth so they would, they're not sort of trained to be, to accept the cost that it would be. And I, and I think Sweden is actually today very close to the rest of Europe or the world in building tradition. So I, and I mean, most of our works are also, you know, cladding of a, I could have a buildings that I could show you that I am sorry that the cladding was not brick, even if it would just be a cladding, but it's actually, Stocco on styrofoam. I have done such buildings too, and I'm, I lament them because in a few decades there will be a hole in the Stocco. And, you know. So, but I think we have a, one could say that we have a duty to ourselves or to our profession and to our fellow men to, to pedagogically say that if we do it like this, it may last three times as much. It may be a little more expensive in the beginning, but it will last forever. I mean, like this, it needn't be, I mean, of course, this church is, is very unusual, and I'm not saying that 
and even the crematorium was a cladding, so that's much more contemporary. But but to to exemplify, I think that's our role as architects, yeah. and uh, so the pedagogically trying to have our clients understand this is. But you know, I don't know if I answered your question. Yes, of course <laughs> you did, and mm -hmm. and I think it's also. Uh, make us feel about the responsibility of, of, of architecture in, in the society, I mean, yes. about this problem of construction. And then I have a, a, a very short uh, uh, quote by Richard Sennett, uh, who, who wrote yes. this yes. very famous book that yes. everybody knows, uh, The yes. Craftsman, yes. and I think it's, it's perfect to describe your work. It's, it states, the craftsman represent the special human condition of being engaged, yeah. being engaged. Yeah. Uh, we, we don't really have this, this in, in, in Italian as a yeah. coinvolti, it's yeah. more like we use more the French yeah. word engagé. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, but to be engaged yeah. doesn't, doesn't mean to be engaged uh, uh, instrumentally. Yeah, yeah. It, it means to be engaged yes. with the role, yeah, yeah. which is the role I of think architects. It's, very it's interesting because it seems that though craft, at least in Sweden where I live, craft is now sort of a trendy term, and of course when everything is streamlined, it's but but there is the the thing about. Um, so now I lost my my train of thought. Ah, um, oh, no, drop it. <laughs> the, um, what, what was your, uh, what was you suggested the, for the artisan and what was your... And the the uh, uh, to be engaged not, not instrumentally, uh, but, but to, to be engaged with yes. giving a role to, to, um, to the work of architects. So Sorry, but uh, leave this, I'll, I'll, I, d I lost it. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, I, I should have one more question, maybe better if you yeah, do, no? No? So I just uh, have a second, a second point, um, which is going to be a question for you. Uh, at the time when I was uh, deeply involved in, in my research is related, uh, related to, um, to the Woodland Cemetery, I realized that uh, uh, at the time when Sigurd Leverenz was, was in, uh, in Germany having uh, his uh, apprentice apprenticeship, uh, it was exactly the same year uh, when uh, Wilhelm Wöhringer published this uh, uh, fundamental book which is called uh, Abstraction und Einfühlung, which is uh, Abstraction und Empathy, in Italian is Abstrazione ed Empatia. And uh, Looking at your work, I was uh, thinking that there is this uh, duality between uh, abstraction and, and, and empathy, uh, but uh, the empathy is not never just towards uh, the place. Of course, there is. This is, again, a very uh, classical feature of Scandinavian architecture, of the genius logy, and so on. We don't have the time to discuss about this now, mm -hmm. uh, there are quite known uh, matters, uh, but there is also an internal empathy towards uh, the, the narrative sequence that you create uh, inside the building for the people who will uh, use them. And uh, the third fact is that uh, this um, duality between abstraction and, and, and empathy, it never, never brings you to the mimesis of the nature. You always l look, you, you are always looking or, or seeking for the most appropriate uh, attitude of the building, but you never, nev you completely avoid the idea of the mimesis of the nature, of being mimetic uh, mm -hmm. to the nature. I say this because there are many students here uh, tonight, and this idea of uh, being mimetic with the nature is something very, very, um, on the um, on the fashion nowadays in in uh, in architecture, and I think it's something completely. I don't want to say wrong, but but uh, but it is in a way. It's something that uh, brings us on another path, which is not uh, yeah. the architectural yeah. research. Yeah. So I don't want if you want to add something well, about this. I mean, our work is so dependent on. Uh, we have, should we say, a toolbox? Or we have these parts that we can, I mean, usually you don't need so many parts to make an interesting combination, usually so many combinations. So I think working within the, 
the tradition is still so rich. And of course things change. I'm not uh, against that, but so I'm not, um, I think that, uh, and I've been working a bit with brick. Now this recent work is more with wood and I've been working with, so uh, I'm quite content with sort of limiting the possibilities. That you can make things that look exactly like something else or, or, or the, the advanced technologies of our time, you could do anything, but it has to make sense to those who are inside. It has to make sense in technical ways and in, in uh, so I, um, I think I stick, but I would like to get back to what I m just missed, this thing about architecture and in Sweden it is much more, there's much more research these days and I think that as a craft you were talking about, I think this interesting thing that craft architecture would say, of course it's good that we do research, that's very important in every field, but I think that the things get a bit sometimes too advanced, too philosophically advanced, whereas buildings are still built on, on uh, uh, no nuts and bolts or whatever, and I think that it's not a bad thing to be a, an artisan, and I think that that's, or the craft is something can be extremely refined. If we think of the finest violin players, if it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, those, the finest musicians that we have, those things cannot be researched to, to achieve that kind of uh, elevation. And that comes from the kind of crafting of playing your violin so much and having this talent within yourself and sort of sticking with that. So I think that it's the craft aspect is, it should be, maybe it's already, as I say, in Swedish areas, Mayo society, maybe it's already gaining, but it's often things are commercialized. But I think the, the unspoken knowledge of craft is very interesting. I think the violin is such, or music is such an interesting, um, that you train, that you learn from someone else, you get ideas how you can expand your, your way of playing. And so if it's a piano or a guitar. That's, that's oh, also oh. very deeply related to pedagogy, yeah, to yeah, the pedagogy of architecture. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Johan. I, I think it was a great lecture. And I want just to say that we need this kind of lecture because I know your book, the recent book, which is a dialogue between your work and your writings. So it is perfectly shown in this lecture. And you, you um, already, Guya said you are a humanist and you, and you speak about the, the art of building. And you said many times, uh, I worked a lot on <laughs> the competition. <laughs> I work a lot on ideas and so, you confirm us, uh, speaking about responsibility of the architect today, that architecture is a slow process, is not at all a quick. Mm -hmm. And so in the schools of architecture, but also in, the, in, the, in practice, we need a lot to imagine because today the numbers of architects in studios can be 100, 200, 300. I know that your studio is uh, craft small, and, uh, and, and is a place where they think and you go into this. And so I, I can say probably banal things like uh, uh, go connecting with Genius Loki. So we see when you, sp when you show your picture that you have a dialogue, not only with presidents, because you dialogue with Hasplund, et cetera, with Alvar Alto, but also with the, with the place. So the, the spirit of the place is really entering and you can see it. Yeah. I think it, this is the difference uh, is craftsmanship, but also is the way to become, to play with uh, rhythms or go against and, and try to, uh, so I think this is the big lecture and this continue the passion of Mediterranean to the north because we have the famous Grand Tour, but then we since many, one century or more, we had the, the travel to the north. Why we travel to the north? This is the big question by Norbert Schulz because we, we travel to the south and we know to see classes. But why we travel to the north? I think because you still represent a passion and something we, we can learn. I mean, 
the way to capture the light, the way to have a dialogue between small places and, and, and big spaces, I think is very, very poetic and very, very interesting. So thank you so much. Uh, I think we can leave the, we can, there is not a question, it's only a, I think we can leave the yes. questions from the public. If there is question, there are questions. So I, I don't hear, I don't understand. Could you I, we can translate, we can translate. Ah, si, si. <laughs> yes. The, the. They are very, yes, yes, they are very, I think they're very, I would, they are, I think they are very important.